It's really wonderful when we can gather together to worship God, to seek his will, to seek his word, to encourage one another, to edify one another, to pray for one another. This is the kingdom of God lived in microcosm as we assemble every Sabbath to worship God, to seek his will and to be a blessing. And every day we read the scriptures and especially on the Sabbath to open the Bible, to listen to somebody else reading out aloud the words of scripture and allowing them to sink into our hearts and to mold and shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. We need godly men to stand in the gap to which God calls us. Just like God called the prophets of old. And Jesus called the disciples and he says, I will make you fishers of men. And he gave them an incredible task to be witnesses of Jesus and to share the good news from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And today, 2,000 years on, that ministry, that commission hasn't ended. You and I are coming to grasp the fullness of Jesus' desire for us. And um, what you and I have is an invitation to participate as fellow laborers with the Lord in the Father's field. And we see this invitation very powerfully played out with Jesus when he was on this earth. On the last day of the feast in Jerusalem, Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And Jesus is inviting us to come to him for the Holy Spirit. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This idea of come, taste and see that the Lord is good, is integral, it's critical to you and me and my journey and understanding the divine imperative for everything that we possibly could be in this life. And yet the religious leaders of Jesus' day didn't understand it. Jesus said to them, John 5, 39, I think it is, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. They lived in their religiosity, but they failed to recognize that Jesus and did not embrace the invitation given to them. And when we turn to the very end of the book of Revelation, Three times the word come appears in, in one verse, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the bride say, the Spirit, the fullness of Jesus, and the bride, the church, say come. And let the one who hears say come. So you have the Spirit and the bride, the church, saying, come. And that those who hear the invitation join and participate and say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Just like Jesus on that last great day, he said, come to me. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. What a powerful and wonderful invitation. And you know, every Sabbath we rehearse that in different ways, in different words, but the same spirit and the Christocentric anchoring on the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is, what he did, and the invitation that he gives to us today. And in order to get to that victorious moment when our names will be confessed by Jesus before the Father and all his angels, you and I are not there yet. There's a journey, a sense of stewardship that we are called to. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. See, the key, you and I, as a part of the body of Christ, experience in microcosm being part of God's family. We call it church. But being part of God's family is really the kingdom of God, where God is sovereign, we are his children, and he equips us to become priests. What does a priest do? A priest speaks, thus says the Lord. But the priest also intercedes on behalf of those he serves. So it's a two-way street. And you and I are a kingdom of priests. And much of that is also experienced in our preparation today. This priesthood embodies love, service, sacrifice, authority, mercy, justice, and covenant. We have this covenant relationship with God that compels us by the Spirit and we live in preparation for the glory to be revealed and the reward given according to what each one has done, um, 
We live in an age of good and evil, of light and dark. And you and I see that, and you and I are invited further. If you read John's testimony of Jesus' message to the seven churches in Revelation, chapter 2, verse 3, chapter 3, is that we must be overcomers. We must be conquerors. The sin, deception, lies, carnal desire. And yet we're invited into the holiness and the perfection of God. And as clay models, we are going through this process. And sometimes church life is difficult. Sometimes it's hard. (laughs) But by God's grace, this is what Jesus is doing. He said, I will build my church. And he's inviting us. I will make you fishers of men. And we can look to him and trust no matter what the circumstances are. And we know that in this equation, in this invitation, we're not alone. Jesus, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age. And so we stand and operate under the sovereignty of God, under his high calling. We know what it's like to be redeemed, forgiven of all our sins, cleansed from unrighteousness, and then live everything we say and do to the glory of God. And that's an ongoing process. And I want to talk about this chain of command, this chain of authority, this chain of identity and equipping and a participation that gives our witness in this world credibility and authenticity. Turn to Revelation. I want to begin by introducing a sevenfold link in the first three verses of Revelation. It can help us understand not only the book of Revelation, but our identity in our place and our invitation and our stewardship. So if you've got your Bible there, I'll have also the scriptures on the screen. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So in those, that first verse, we see four personages mentioned. Jesus Christ, God the Father, the angel who was the messenger, and John who received the vision. Let's continue to read. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the, writ- and to the testimony of Jesus, even to all that he saw. John wrote down what he saw. Verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now, we are all very familiar with that. What's very interesting is there's a seven-link chain of relationship, of command, of authority, of stewardship in this process. And this is not something transcendent that doesn't concern us. It involves you and me as modern-day disciples and followers of Jesus. First, we have God the Father, the sovereignty of God the Father. No one can come to the Father except through Jesus. So Jesus is a second chain in the link. In Revelation, the next chain in the link was a messenger, the angel sent to John to convey to him all the vast transcendent reality of those things that are yet to occur. Then you have John. He's the fourth link in the chain on the Isle of Patmos, told to write down everything that he heard and saw. And so we have 22 chapters of Revelation. Then we have today the written word. The written word is very, very important. Anything that's important in our society and historically is written. If we go back five, six thousand years ago, we don't have any written records from before then. We understand so much about past civilizations by what they wrote down. And the significance of God with his finger on tablets of stone writing down the ten words, or as we know them, the ten commandments, is What Jesus referred to in the book of Matthew when he says, it is written. It is written. The the capacity for the word of God to appear in writing form is very powerful, very significant. Then the sixth link in the chain are the readers. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. That's you and me today. You and I read the scriptures as received and given to us, written by someone, in this case John, and you and I read it out. Now, we do this every Sabbath when we assemble together. So not only do we worship and sing and pray and teach and and encourage one another, we also read scripture. 
as a fundamental part of Sabbath worship services. And you and I need to be embedded in the word, written word of God. Because God chose to reveal himself not only through the creation, but he reveals himself through the written word. And he re- reveals himself by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear. When you speak in the name of Jesus Christ according to Scripture in your testimony to other people, you are blessed. And those who hear your testimony are those who are blessed as well, who take to heart and keep. And you and I are the sixth link in the chain. Once you and I were the seventh link of the chain, we heard the gospel spoken as a testimony and we responded one way or another. Now we are one step up the chain in that we are the sixth link, that we read out aloud the word of God. Thus says the God, thus says the Lord. We actually speak the very oracles of God, not our words, so that everything that you and I say now becomes like plagiarized. It comes from a higher authority. And you can stand strong when you're anchored and eyes fixed on Jesus. You don't have to feel that you're alone or you have to try to struggle for resources to give your testimony. I'm with Jesus. I'm with him. And so what we have then through the book of Revelation and through the scriptures generally is an unveiling of the person of Jesus. Jesus told those Pharisees that all of the scriptures they had from Genesis to Malachi testify of him. All those scriptures and their marvelous prophecies that take this image of Jesus and place him into a future reality that you and I are yet to see, but in the heavenly equation is as good as exists. The future eternal kingdom of God. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. And you and I are part of this process as fellow laborers of God. We are people under authority. Listen to Jesus to understand how this works. John chapter 14. Jesus talked about his ministry on this earth 2,000 years ago. John chapter 14, verse 10. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? This oneness of covenant relationship. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. So at the very top of the chain hierarchy, Jesus giving attribution to his Father and acknowledge that he wasn't on his own agenda. He did the words and the will of his Father. Verse 11 of John 14, Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves, when the blind see and the dead are raised and the lame rejoice. What do you do with that? Believe on account of the works themselves. Verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. There's an invitation. It's not just Jesus esoterically some 2,000 years ago making some wonderful manifestations of the glory of God. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Do you contemplate the scope of the invitation that you and I are given? Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's a lot at stake when we come before God and ask him for strength. And, Father, please guide me. I don't know what to do. This is too hard, too difficult. I'm not equipped. I'm not... No. You are in Christ, convicted and guided by the Holy Spirit. For if you ask me anything in my name, says Jesus, I will do it. So you're not relying on your own strength. What Jesus said and what he did originated with the Father. And you and I are called into oneness with Jesus. I and you and you and me. As Paul said, until Christ is formed in you. That you experience the oneness and the love of God by knowing Jesus, your Saviour. And knowing how much we are loved. And so the Lordship of Christ brings us to say, how do we move forward? How do we step into the space that God has called us? Well, as Apostle Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Do you want to know how to live and how to walk and how to speak? 
and how to overcome and how to fight those spiritual battles. Paul understood the chain of command, the chain of authority, the chain of reality. And you and I, brothers and sisters, are invited into this grand vision, this transcendent reality of the glory of God, that you and I are created in God's image and likeness for his glory. This is the vision that appeals to you and me. Jesus said to his disciples of that day, Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plenty. I'm speaking of the human harvest. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his field. And when you begin to pray about something, it becomes your personal burden. And you come before the throne of grace and you beseech God earnestly and it becomes your personal burden, your holy discontent, if you want to use that terminology, to then participate in being part of the solution. You start off in prayer and then you step out in faith. And Jesus says, anything you ask, I will do it for you. That's why prayer is so important. You cannot live a day without earnest prayer and diligent scripture reading. You come before God to bring your petitions and praise, but then you listen to the words of Scripture as God reveals himself in the written word. It is written. And so as prayer and reading of the Scriptures go together, it builds our conscience, forms our soul, develops our character, invites us into stewardship and participation, and then we can handle the sacrifice and the cost of following Christ and then expect, by God's grace, the reward that will follow. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to what he has done. So stewardship and servanthood of Jesus is very important, considering the gifts that God has given you personally. Whatever God has given you, no two people are alike. You may have the gift of administration or the gift of preaching or the gift of teaching or the gift of mercy or whatever gift God has given you. There's a stewardship to develop that and grow that and serve in the body of Christ. The family that God has invited us into. The Apostle Paul understood this chain of command that exists from God the Father, Jesus Christ, into the human family. Another manifestation, now we looked at Revelation, the seven link chain. Look at this link here. 1 Corinthians 11.3, Paul teaches those in Corinth, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is a husband, and the head of Christ is God. So you have within the human family, God the Father, Jesus Christ, the loving and sacrificial husband, and the respectful and loving and submissive wife. And husbands, listen, 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 let's take this. This is not popular in today's age of this equality mentality. Let me read from Ephesians 5 because it gives it a bit greater clarity. Verse 20, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what you and I do always in prayer. And I suppose the older you get and more experienced you through life storms, the more you give God praise, the more you give God thanks, the more you acknowledge his sovereignty, his mercy, his grace. Verse 31, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This can happen in husband-wife relationship, submitting to one another. And this happens within the church community. That's why we don't forsake assembling ourselves together. Because how can we submit to one another when we seldom meet? The idea is that we meet and we listen to one another. I was with a brother just recently, and he's going through some difficult times. And he confessed his struggle and his liability in the equation of the challenges he's facing. It was very encouraging and inspiring, because unless we live in community, in the warmth and the love and the joy and the trust and the mercy and the grace of God's Spirit working in us, how is it that iron sharpens iron? How do we care for one another? How do we pray for one another? How do we reach out into each other's lives except in the close-knit resilience of community? In family, and Paul says in Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. 
For as the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now, as a church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in, in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. And what's the perfect model? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's love. What are we talking about is not infatuation, not friendship love. We're talking about authentic sacrificial love, agapo. This chain of authority really impressed Jesus when he encountered the centurion who had a sick son. Matthew chapter 8. Jesus offers to come to his home and heal the, the sickness. And the centurion says in Matthew chapter 8 verse 9, For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, no one in Israel have I found such faith. Wow. It was a Roman centurion. He understood the chain of authority that he was under, beginning with Caesar and the generals and the commanders. And he was a centurion with a hundred men under him. And he says, I operate like this, and I know, Jesus, you say the word, and it'll be done for you. Wow. This centurion understood the reality of authority, of command, of relationship, of participation. In John chapter 17, we also see this chain of relationship. First, Jesus prays to the Father, and he gives the Father thanks, and he acknowledges the Father. Then Jesus prays for himself. Then he prays for his immediate disciples, and then he prays for those who would believe on account of their testimony. John, Mark, Matthew, and later, of course, Luke, and of course, other Peter as well. So he prayed for his disciples, and he extended that invitation because we believe on account of their testimony. As Peter later on wrote in his epistle, he said, you love Jesus, though you've not yet seen, you've not seen him. He's writing to a new generation of people who are hearing the word for the first time. Though you haven't seen him, you love him, says Peter. And scripture, when you hear, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And when you hear the word of God and the Holy Spirit convicts your heart, you begin to sense the invitation to a wedding banquet, to fellowship. As Jesus says, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. We're going to share a table. As you wrote to the church in Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3. And you and I offered divine destiny, formed out of the dust of the ground in an adversarial world, being molded and shaped to overcome and equipped by the blood of the Lamb, made righteous, the free gift of righteousness. Everything, brothers and sisters, are in our favour. John 5, 17, Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. And if you follow the chain of command and authority down, you and I are invited into the very work of God as fellow laborers in the field harvest that's ripe for harvest. So beautiful to have open church coming up in a few weeks' time, open day. So beautiful to be able to have those of us gifted in writing or inclined to writing to submit an article to the Edify magazine. So beautiful, so many of us have the, the sense of presence to confess the gospel openly into the public in the name of Jesus according to it is written in the scripture. All of us have different gifts. It starts with the Father who's working. It continues with Jesus. Then Jesus sent the counselor, the comforter, the helper, the convictor of our hearts and minds and soul. And you and I begin participating as labourers in the field of ripe for harvest. Jesus says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. They waited after Jesus ascended to heaven, 10 days after he ascended. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit manifests as tongues of fire. We know the story in Acts. And you will be my witnesses. 
in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the end of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria were known parts of the known world. The end of the earth. It took 2,000 years, and here we are, closer to the, the time when the fullness of the kingdom of God will be upon us. Brothers and sisters, we've been entrusted with stewardship, with a direct chain of command. You and I are fellow laborers with God, a higher noble calling to authentically reflect and mirror Christ as Lord and King of the kingdom of God in everything that we say and do, to be authentic witnesses of Jesus. People may wonder about you, but the greatest thing that they can wonder about you is that you are a follower of Jesus, that you are with him, that you are on his side of history. And we experience that, brothers and sisters, in weekly Sabbath assembly. We experience that when we assemble together in Scripture reading and we pray without ceasing. And from outside of the six days of the rest of the week, we reflect his glory, the authenticity of immersed in private prayer, immersed in scripture reading, and able to have a well-formed testimony according to the gifts that God gives us. Brothers and sisters, this is non-negotiable. We put our hand to the plow and we don't look back. Anybody who's called and equipped and convicted by the Spirit and turns our head and looks back, as Jesus said, is not worth for the, worthy of the kingdom of God. And so there's a word of encouragement. I heard a, somebody ask his congregation recently, how many of you have read the Bible from cover to cover? Put your hands up. And very few people put their hands up. And he said, it's very important. You need to read the whole Bible because in the resurrection, in the resurrected glory, you will meet all those people from Scripture that you've hopefully read about. And Obadiah will come up to you and says, well, how did you find my testimony in 2024? And how many of us have read Obadiah? Or what about Zephaniah when he will say, what were some of the takeaway points for you living in the 21st century? <laughs> I didn't even know there was a Zephaniah. And the whole audience just broke out in laughter. But the serious side of it, what if the Lord says to you, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Did you hear my word? Did you take to heart what was written? You know, the book of Matthew mentions it is written eight times. The authority of the written scripture. Did you read my word daily, says Jesus? You know, the ancient kings of Israel, the commission to them, the judges and the kings, were told to have a book of the law, the holy scriptures open and read to them all the time. They were to read the scriptures and so to act justly with mercy and truth and holiness. But as we know, the covenantal relationship between the Lord and ancient Israel failed. Not because God failed, but because people failed. And I, I'm reading Second Kings at the moment, and I'm so broken by the liturgy of wickedness, the propensity for malevolence and untruth, and the suffering as a result of it. Brothers and sisters, you and I have everything we need to know in this life about who God is, what our identity is. Because God, number one, has revealed it through his creation. We teach our children, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But God's also revealed it by his divinely written word. It is written. And the conviction and the understanding of his divine word comes thirdly by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates the very scriptures the Holy Spirit inspired. And the biblical corpus is all that we have as our authoritative constitutional document for all matters of practice and faith. Praise God for those faithful people who preceded us in the writing down, in the preserv preservation, in the translation, in the printing, in the publishing, where the Holy Bible is the world's most printed, published, and translated and distributed a book in all of human history. It breaks my heart that Australia is becoming a secular country, or as we are now in the post-Christian era, the consequences of which are dawning on us now. 2,000 years ago, 
the Apostle John, as we believe it, John of Patmos at least, was told to write down all that he saw and experienced and send it to the churches. And the, it originated from God the Father. We see Jesus glorified. The angelic message, messenger brings that, the various facets of the message to John. We have John who experienced it. We have the written version of it down. We are invited as readers to read out aloud the scriptures. And then we have, there's a blessing on those who hear, who take to heart and who keep what is written. That's our work of witness. You know, the saints are those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. You know, we are called to speak the very oracles of God. Because mankind will be judged by every idle word they speak. And so you and I, by the Holy Spirit, are convicted in the image of Jesus for the glory of our Father to only speak the oracles of God. And so the book of Revelation that we are currently navigating in our weekly Bible study series brings so much edification and insight for the church then and the church now. This community, this kingdom of God lived in microcosm. For us, the chain of a command is a little bit different from John. In one sense, it's the Father who calls us. It's Jesus who equips us. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts us. It's the written word that instructs us. And when we assemble the kingdom of God in microcosm as a church community, we begin to be able to work and proclaim by, number six, reading out aloud the very authority of, thus says the Lord. And the seventh link of the chain are those who hear our testimony because we hear the testimony of a previous generation, godly men in the first century who wrote according as the Holy Spirit carried them. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We are living in those days that Daniel longed to look into. And you and I have stewardship, responsibility, and participation, overcoming, sacrifice, and great reward. Through you and I, today, in 2024, and equipping those that are going to follow us, have great responsibility. Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age. <laughs> 